Welcome to this video conference on understanding equity and achieving it, sponsored by EdSource in partnership with Education Trust West. I'm Lewis Friedberg, Executive Director of EdSource, here with Ryan Smith. Ryan Ex Smith, Executive Director of EdTrust West. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you. This event will focus on one of the most pressing issues and arguably most complex issues facing education reform in California how to ensure greater equality, both in education opportunities and education outcomes for all California's children. We know this is an issue of concern, huge concern to many of you, over 900 people, many of you working in the trenches in school districts and in classrooms throughout the state have signed up to participate. This is a very positive sign that you all recognize the urgent work that we all face as educators and as a state and as a nation. And uh, I'll just say with that many people on the line, we are hoping there won't be any technical glitches, but bear with us if there are. We will ask each of the panelists to make short presentations of about three to five minutes, and then we'll open it up to your questions. And to do that, you can go to the right side of your screen. You will see a small question icon and click on that and enter your questions. And we will try to get to as many of those as we can in an hour. We see this as the first of several discussions on this topic. And uh, don't anticipate that we'll be able to get all the answers, but at least to get the dialogue going on this critical topic. Uh, California is at a pivotal period in its reformed efforts. And uh, as we say at its source, the key now is to make these reforms work. To that end, we have a distinguished panel of scholars and practitioners. To introduce them, I'm going to turn to my co-moderator, Ryan Smith. Thank Ryan. you. Thank you, Lewis. And uh, just building on what Lewis said, really happy that we could uh, get 900 folks uh, tuning into this webinar, um, particularly the practitioners uh, who are uh, actually keyed in. So I'm excited to introduce our esteemed panel. Um, you know, we often talk about uh, closing achievement opportunity gaps. And we often have discussions around equity. I often like to say equity is the new coconut water. It's the trend we're all talking about, but not everybody's necessarily drinking just yet. So let me tell you, this panel is actually drinking um, equity and are, and are doing a really good work every day. So uh, to begin, I'd like to introduce Aria Montes Rodriguez, the executive vice president. Hmm? Oh, well, Oh, are you going to do this? Yeah, I'm just yeah. going to introduce everyone and then we'll come back to Tyrone. So, Ariel Montes Rodriguez is the Executive Vice President of Community Coalition, um, and which is a social justice organization based in South Los Angeles and serves as a vehicle for everyday residents to tackle the most pressing community issues and has been involved in a number of education campaigns over her esteemed 20 years, I believe, at Community Coalition. Next up, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tyrone Howard. He is a professor uh, at the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies at UCLA, and he's also the Associate Dean of Equity, Diversity, and uh, Inclusion, uh, and the Director and Founder of the Black Male Institute at UCLA. I'd like to introduce uh, Jorge Aguilar. Jorge Aguilar is, serves as the Superintendent of Sacramento City Unified School District. Uh, and has more than 20 years of K-12 and higher education experience with a strong focus and background on issues of equity and student achievement. Thank you for uh, coming today. I'd also like to introduce Professor Andrea Benizia. She's the Associate Professor in Public Policy and Administration for the Department of, um, for California State University, Sacramento, and she's the Executive Director of Ed Insights Center. Uh, and her experience is definitely geared towards college and career readiness. Uh, and she is an amazing data expert uh, in the state as well. Thank you. Um, last but certainly not least, uh, many of you know Shinoline uh, Cruz Gonzalez from a lot of different um, walks. Um, not only does she currently serve as a uh, school board member on the uh, Azusa School Board, uh, she is the vice president of California uh, school Boards Association, and she is an amazing director with Californians uh, together who are doing amazing advocacy work for English learners up and down the state. So um, with that, uh, we'll actually begin with a question to Tyrone, which I can start us off with. 
Tyrone, uh, Tyrone Howard from UCLA. The, I think there's, in terms of framing the discussion, we're hoping you'll be able to do this. I think one of the questions is when we're talking about equity, are we talking about equity of opportunity or equity in outcomes and uh, or both? So I appreciate the question, Lewis, and I want to thank everyone for taking time out of their schedules to join us because I think this is uh, perhaps one of our most pressing issues of our lifetimes as we think about issues around equity and education. Uh, I think when you when you ask that question, Lewis, and to try to help provide some framing for our discussion today, uh, I think it's really about equity and opportunity, which I think then begins to inform equity and outcomes. I think what we have to do, if we're going to really be honest and if we're really going to be serious about this conversation, we have to move away from this conversation around equality. I oftentimes get the question around why do you make such a distinction between equality versus equity. And for me, and I, I, and, and I love to hear from others as we have this conversation, equality really centers on this idea of continuing to give everyone the same types of resources and the same types of opportunities. And we've tried the equality right for some time and we only continue to see ongoing disparities. And so I think what, uh, what equity really asks us to do, forces us to do, moves us to do, is to recognize that we have historical factors that have created large scale disparities across groups uh, in this country for, for centuries on end. And one of the things that equity does for us, it allows us to acknowledge those historical uh, uh, realities that have really shaped the kinds of life opportunities that certain groups have had. Have. Uh, equity also forces us to look at the economic and the social and the political discrepancies that have shaped uh, the, the very landscape of our states uh, and of our nation in ways that continues to put poor people and people of color in situations where they've always been on the outside looking for an opportunity be self-actualized. So what I hope that we can do is begin to really have a bold and honest and courageous conversation around how equity moves us in a different direction, takes us in a new venture, uh, begins to ask certain types of questions that perhaps we have not been willing, but we have needed to ask for a very long time. Now, one of the things I think we have to think about is why many people are a little bit unaf afraid or a little bit uh, uh, not really willing to engage in conversations around equities because equity forces us to have to reckon with our past. Uh, equity flies in the face of meritocracy. Oftentimes what we have to come to grips with if we're going to have an equity minded uh, conversation around how equity becomes part and parcel in the fabric of how we think about education, it means that we have to be prepared. And this is the real sort of a sticking point for many folks. We have to be prepared to give certain groups additional types of resources, additional types of opportunities, additional types of pathways that they have historically not been provided access to. That very reality right there causes many people to really cringe because they feel like, why should others receive more? We believe in this notion of equality. But I think what this does, it really calls into question privilege and how privilege has played out for certain groups for, again, centuries on end. We're trying to dismantle privilege. We're trying to dismantle this notion of, of, of meritocracy, which says that people are where they are because of their own merits and because of their own efforts. Part of what this is about is having a real conviction about naming the groups. We're talking about uh, folks of color. We're talking about uh, language learners. We're talking about immigrants. We're talking about folks in the LGBTQ community. We're talking about low income populations. Uh, and the list can go on. And so part of what I hope today's conversation is about, we have a group of really uh, esteemed and, and expert panelists who are in the trenches, who are doing the works in communities, in schools, uh, talking about school funding, talking about how we service schools, talking about language, talking about policy. Uh, and those are the conversations that we need to have, not just one time, not just a couple of times, they need to be a staple of our ongoing discussions if we're really serious about creating a better future for all of our children and our children's children, because uh, we don't wanna be looked at as the generation who continue to nibble on the edges of what we talk about when it, came, when it comes to access and opportunity. We hope to be looked at as the generation who was bold, uh, who was courageous, uh, who was who was unapologetic by saying that there needs to be a concerted effort for do to do more for those who have historically received less. So that would be the framing I would use to kind of start our conversation, Lewis and Ryan, to say that equity is about how we think about uh, understanding that achievement gaps uh, are oftentimes a direct link to opportunity gaps, or the gaps in housing, the gaps in fair wages. Uh, the gaps across gender, uh, the gaps in, in, when it comes to safe neighborhoods, the gap when it comes to mental health services. So we have to talk about equity within the framework of real pressing gaps uh, that are a direct result of what 
Lori Lassen Billings oftentimes refers to as the education debt. So we're talking debt, we're talking equity, we're talking about authentic uh, pathways that oftentimes have not been available. So with that, I'm excited. Uh, I think my time is up uh, and I will allow us to move on to the, to, to the esteemed panelists who are here with Howard. us. Professor Howard, just quickly, when you're talking about uh, equity and opportunity, are you talking about both school-based opportunities and broader social opportunities, economic opportunities? All of them, because I believe, Lewis, that, that schools mirror communities and communities mirror society. So we can't do one without the other. You can't say you want strong schools, but then you've got communities that are still not in place. You can't, if you show me strong, strong communities, you will have strong tools. So I think we can't uh, disentangle them. They have to be viewed and looked at and thought about and addressed as one and the same. And I think one of the things we're going to be getting in the discussion, because I think a lot of people in the school will say, well, we don't have the resources and how do we provide these uh, great opportunities in areas that are outside schools jurisdiction? Yeah. And I think that's actually a really good segue to go to Superintendent Jorge Aguilar. So, um, Jorge, I know that you uh, have recently been appointed uh, superintendent at Sacramento C Unified, but also was, uh, served as assistant superintendent at Fresno Unified. And I'm sure you're thinking about equity in terms of resource equity and budgeting, particularly because the conversation around local control funding formula has really forced practitioners, administrators, superintendents to think differently about their resources. So how do you think about equity um, in terms of resources? Thank you for inviting me. Normally, I would um, talk about how we're advancing equity, access, and social justice in the areas of higher education, seamless transitions between K-12 and higher ed, which is what we've been doing for about a decade now. But I, I like the question, um, Ryan. I mean, you know, now serving as superintendent, um, this question of what does equity and the interface with equality, I mean, I think that uh, to Dr. Uh, Howard's uh, point. I mean, you know, in some ways in, in this position, you kind of uh, realize that maybe somebody tried to advance equality and then we screwed up, which is why we have to now address equity. Um, um, but if you follow, you know, Deming's quote of every system is designed perfectly to get the results that it gets, um, and even a core value statement that we have in Sac City, which basically calls out that we've designed an inequitable system. Um, then um, what we've been spending uh, the past uh, several months on is this question of what are we trying to make up for um, in Sac City uh, from an equity lens? Um, if we look at, for example, uh, schools that have much higher rates of students that um, are at risk when we look at early warning system data, uh, when we look at uh, some schools that Unfortunately, in our community, um, we were suffering um, as a result of uh, commercial sexual exploitation of our children. Uh, so there's a number of data points uh, where you can see variation in, in, in issues related to equity. Um, and so we've been uh, sort of having very creative uh, conflict in, 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 in our rooms um, with senior leaders and principals talking about this question, what are we trying to make up for? Um, and not at a philosophical level, but really, I mean, what, what are we trying to make up for when we see that we have some schools where we have higher rates of teachers that are absent more than 10 days and, and research suggests that that has a big impact on our students or administrative uh, or administrator absences um, or early warning system data, et cetera. When, when you have a discussion about what are you trying to make up for, then the next natural question that, that, that should that should be raised is how do you make up for whatever you have decided you have a duty to make up for, right? Um, and, and in my opinion, there's only one way of doing it and that starts with how you budget. Um, um, that is that we have the ability to budget from an equity lens uh, for the purpose that uh, Dr. Uh, Howard was describing that you know we have to provide additional resources to certain students. Uh, well. Uh, we're no different than most traditional urban school districts. When I was asked, when I asked uh, for a briefing on how we budget um, uh, our, uh, for school allocations, it was a very traditional, you know, it's done by FTE. So if you have 799 students or below, you don't have an assistant principal. If you have 800 or above, you get an assistant principal. 
So this idea of budgeting um, uh, using a very traditional approach um, is not going to address uh, the equity concerns that I have. Uh, so we've gone about um, um, creating, and I'd love to, to have further conversations, creating what we're calling equity indices uh, from a budgetary standpoint on five areas. Um, facilities, IT, student support services, academic achievement, and staffing. Um, and in the area of student support services, for example, we're, um, we're about to release a budget proposal to our board uh, that takes into consideration uh, providing additional resources from a budget perspective, not on the traditional FTE enrollment, but rather which schools have the highest percentage of students uh, that, have, that are showing deficiencies in academics, in attendance, and in behavior altogether. Uh, which of our schools um, um, have, uh, have had to wait the longest uh, for paint jobs? Um, or uh, which of our schools uh, have the least amount of resources from a technology perspective? Uh, which of our schools uh, have uh, the highest percentage uh, of teachers with fewer than five years of teaching experience, right? Um, and so we're building these real-time equity indices uh, where all we have to do is shift the weights of each of those data points uh, to give us a sense of where a school stands with respect to the additional needs that we might budget for. Um, and I'm very fortunate, and I'll close with this, I'm very fortunate that we have a Board of Education uh, that has gone through uh, some learning sessions around the question that, uh, that we introduced at the beginning of this webinar, which is how do you see the world as a board member? Do you see it from an equality standpoint or do you see it from an equity standpoint? Because as, as, as most of you know, a superintendent um, works with uh, a school board um, and, and we have to uh, be, be perfectly aligned to make sure uh, that, um, that uh, we, don't, uh, we, we can overcome the tension of, of, of board members who might want to advance a, a budget process only from an equality standpoint uh, and, and instead uh, begin to look at it from an equity standpoint. Superintendent, can I just ask you a question about how this ties in with the local control funding formula and the local control and accountability plan, which I know most of you listening now are familiar with, but targeting extra funds, I mean, that is the whole purpose of the LCFF. This seems consistent with that, this approach, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it, it sure does, Louis. And, and I'll say that on Monday, we had um, about 30 community-based organizations that we invited uh, to present this plan to them and ask them to co-create and then co-facilitate uh, learning sessions and workshops with parents uh, who would in turn understand how to read uh, data within each of these five equity indices uh, so that they could begin to empower themselves and begin to demand uh, that resources be alloc allocated uh, within the spirit of LCFF, as you just mentioned. Okay, well, I know we're going to come back to that. Yeah, and I actually think this is a um, building on your uh, equity indices, as you mentioned. It actually reminds me of the work that LAUSD has done around the student needs index and thinking differently about how they target uh, some of their LCFF funds. And I wanted to uh, go to Aria very quickly because I know that community coalition and groups like Inner City Struggle, um, the Advancement Project, work very closely with LAUSD uh, to create that student needs index. So we'd love to know um, what that's done, given that Jorge is the beginning of the process and you are actually in probably year two or three or, uh, in implementing the Student Needs Index. But also, I know the Community Coalition does a, a lot of work building partnerships with local schools in South LA. There are expanded learning opportunities through the Freedom School and others. So how do you partner um, with schools and the district uh, in order to close uh, opportunity achievement gaps? So thank you, Ryan, and um, great to hear from you, Superintendent Aguilar and Dr. Howard. Um, so, you know, we have, Community Coalition was founded to deal with the impacts of the crack epidemic. And uh, we have been organizing uh, residents and young people um, to deal with the impacts of the epidemic. Um, and 
Um, we were really excited when the LCFF uh, was adopted because our young people have been working on education reform uh, campaign since 1997. Um, they led the charge to make college prep courses the default curriculum uh, at the LAUSD. They also worked to win positive school climate at all the um, LAUSD schools, especially focusing on ending punitive uh, discipline practices at South LA and East LA and Southeast uh, LA schools. Um, and they were, you know, um, very active in a statewide alliance to pass Proposition 30. Um, and really uh, were excited about the fact that the governor wanted to target um, Prop 30 funding and LCFF funding um, to areas of the state that had a higher concentrations of students that were English learners, foster youth, and low income. And so in 2014, we actually joined forces with Inner City Struggle and Advancement Project uh, to develop a student equity need index that could align with what students and parents were telling us uh, that they were experiencing at their schools where when um, the, uh, the state or our economy experienced um, a recession, um, their schools felt the greatest hit. And we were coming out of the 2008-2010 recession and they were saying that while new funding was coming um, to the district and maybe not getting us um, to higher levels post the recession, that they were worried that if the districts uh, gave out the money and the funding equally, sprinkled the money across the district, their schools really wouldn't receive the types of supports um, and targeted attentions that they know they need uh, because schools in South LA, East LA, and uh, the Southeast and East San Fernando Valley are really experiencing higher rates of um, community issues like um, higher asthma rates, uh, greater exposure to gun violence. Um, and so, you know, we developed this uh, equity index. The district actually uh, adopted it um, through what was called the Equity is Justice Resolution. Uh, but then we learned um, in 2016 that they didn't apply the index as they had promised to do so. And even more alarming, they had actually misspent um, concentration funds that added to that now add up to a billion dollars uh, of additional funding that students who are low income, um, uh, foster youth and English learners are generating for the district. And so we actually sued the district. Um, our students uh, and a parent from inner city struggle uh, sued the district and we were successful in getting $150 million uh, targeted for um, schools that are identified as highest need uh, by the equity index that we developed. And we're really excited, saw that as a huge victory that um, speaks to and acknowledges uh, what Dr. Um, uh, Tyrone Howard spoke to, which is that these communities are experiencing a greater level of need. Um, and we're actually really excited right now because we are engaging, we have been in conversations uh, with the leadership at the LAUSD for about a year, asking that they update the index and that they apply actual funding from the concentration and supplemental funds um, to meet the needs of the highest and high need elementary, middle, and high schools. And so this month is critical for us. We actually um, presented the updated index uh, to, uh, we have been doing meetings with the school board members. Uh, we've already uh, started to talk to, um, we came to the uh, committee of the whole um, at the LAUSD yesterday. Um, but in the next couple of weeks, we should hear more um, public discussion about the updated index and about the community's expectations, the expectation of students and parents um, to see the district uh, make a greater commitment for how they're going to target um, LCFF funding to these high and highest need schools. Um, and then, Ryan, the last piece that you um, had asked me to speak about um, is, you know, how does community coalition uh, develop youth leadership um, and how do we offer expanded learning opportunities? And for us, you know, our organizing of African-American and Latino students at the South LA high schools 
has been a critical way uh, to challenge uh, what we were, uh, a notion that we were really um, concerned about in the early 1990s when the country in dealing with the crack epidemic was seeing young people as a throwaway generation. And for a community that was devastated by the crack epidemic, that is something that we really couldn't afford to do. And as the young people uh, learn organizing skills um, through their uh, equity campaigns, um, you know, we actually get to see young people that um, as they learn public speaking, campaign uh, development strategy, campaign strategy, um, you know, uh, research, meeting facilitation, um, and they take those skills into their schools and develop committees on their campuses to train other students from their student body. Uh, we really get to see how um, our organizing programs help to both close the achievement gap, but more importantly, increase the opportunity um, for young people to be both college ready um, and career ready. And so I, uh, we also partner um, with the Children's right. Home um, to run a Freedom Schools that follows a similar model and works with young people uh, during the summer over a seven week period to really um, have um, a, a, an intensive experience um, that prepares the youth um, to be ready for the next year and not suffer from the learning gap. And so um, for us, the right. youth organizing and um, building um, youth and um, people power is really a way to ensure that equity stays at the forefront mm -hmm. of um, the public discussion and yep. the interaction with um, the, the LAUSD and, and the leadership at the at the district. Quick question for you. Um, I think we're getting a, a request to um, repeat components of the equity indexes that we're talking about. So, um, Aria, can you just quickly talk about what are the components and Jorge, both, both of you guys, so you can talk about the components of your equity indices. I so, think the question, could other districts, could other districts do a set up these indexes, or indices, I mm -hmm. guess, or, or is this a really difficult thing to do? So we have been going back and forth with the district about the indicators. And so there's a set of academic indicators, including uh, math scores, um, um, graduation rates, uh, suspension rates. Um, but for community, for the community, uh, what parents and students at Community Coalition have been asking for is that we include community indicators especially asthma rates and exposure to gang, uh, to uh, gun violence, because when you add this community indicators, then you really see in a visual way, the areas that have uh, a, a greater concentration of higher need. And so um, we are going back and forth with the district about the final indicators that will be included. Um, but I think that what has been critical for us in terms of equity is that we uh, ensure that the uh, asthma rate and gun violence be included in the final uh, index. And also, okay. Ray, I think we, we got to go to quickly to Jorge. I think I think one of the questions also was this is this index online? I think I think there's quite a bit of I've seen a fair amount of data on that on online, right? It's Will be, it will be as soon as uh, we get the agreement uh, from the LAUSD to move forward with it. So we will share it online. Terrific. Okay, okay, just quickly, the five things that you are looking at in the district there. Yeah, the five things, uh, we are looking at uh, student support services. So we have an equity index around student support services, how we fund and allocate, um, for example, PPS credentialed social workers, uh, counseling, um, et cetera. Um, so there's a student support services equity index. We have one that's focused on staffing. Um, we have one that's around academic achievement, um, sort of the kinds of uh, contracts, tutoring programs, partnerships that we have uh, at each of our school sites. Uh, we have another one on IT, sort of technology index. And then we have one um, that's focused on facilities. Those are the five indices that we have. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So, um, you know, let's go to uh, Shinaline Cruz Gonzalez. So, you know, when we're thinking about equity gaps, particularly, 
um, achievement gaps in California, we have to talk about English learners. Um, one in five students in California are English learners, and we know that um, some gaps actually slightly grew last year for English learners. And you've been a key advocate for um, a number of years about uh, specifically focusing and targeting supports for EL students. So what do we need to do in the state uh, to address the English learner equity gaps that we see? Thank you, Ryan. Um, so I just want to first start off by saying I appreciate that both Jorge and Aurea started talking with budget, right? Because I think it starts with budget. I'm talking from my perspective as a school board member and working with Californians together. Um, uh, it's, it's a common a common phrase that is said is that the budget is a reflection of your values, right? So if we are not willing to go back and review those budgets and make sure they're aligned to what we the outcomes that we want to see then that means that we're not willing to make the changes that we need to make to get those equitable outcomes. Um, that being said, I think that we're at a, we have a great opportunity in California with several factors. One, we now have local control funding formula that specifically gives us not only flexibility at the local district side, the district level, but also gives us funding specifically for English learners to think about how do we serve their needs. And there's two other pieces that I think at the state level that I think are can be a great impetus for, for seeing that change to addressing those gaps that you just referenced, Ryan. Gaps that have existed for, for a very long time. And those are two pieces. One, the passage of Prop 58. Uh, right? we have we having you, slight difficulty with your audio. Could you just repeat the last sentence that you... Yeah, let me get a little closer. Is that better? Maybe a little too far away. Is that better? Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so so um, there, there's two state level pieces that I think that can be helpful levers for change. Can you hear me now? This, is this better? Um, one is Prop 58. Um, with the passage of Prop 58, we have now undone over two, almost two decades of an English only approach that has been failing our students. Um, I think districts now have the opportunity to think think deeply locally about what is the best way to serve English learners. Um, especially being able to capitalize on the assets they come, right. that come that come with them with their hey, primary Shalene. language. Shalanine, yeah. Can I put you on hold? We're going to see what we can do with your sound. Okay. Uh, I want to go to Andrea, and hopefully we can get that fixed. Um, is, it, is that is that better? I switched over my mics to a different mic. Much that, better. Okay, I switched mics. Okay, so I, I I'll, and I'll just be very brief. I think I feel like with Prop 58 passage. Right, we now have opportunities to rethink locally what we can do um, with the adoption of the English Learner Roadmap by the State Board of Education. We now have clear guidance across the state that we need to have comprehensive approach to view our, our to view how our English learners right. And so that means that as we as districts can't be thinking about English learners in this silo where we're going to have an English learner master plan and that's going to serve the needs of all students. Right, the EL Roadmap is very focused on making sure that we have an assets oriented approach and that we're needs responsive, and that we're giving meaningful access to all of our students. Um, and so what it means is, is that we have to think more deeply locally about the, the English learners that we're serving. They are not a monolithic group. Um, and uh, when you talk about with educators, they'll talk about the different types of typologies, meaning the different types of English learners we have. And so districts really need to go back and critically look at what students are they serving. There's a very different approach that you would use with a, with a recent arrival, often called newcomers, versus a long-term English learner who you have probably had in your district since kindergarten or TK. There's a different approach that you would use with a student that comes from a family that's well-educated and has had formal education in their country versus a student that uh, often called a SIFE, a student with interrupted formal education, right, who may be coming from a war-torn area. You, we, have, we have areas in this, in this state where they're getting many refugees from Syria, other places, where these students do have gaps. So how we address our needs, mean, that means that we as districts or at school sites need to think about how are we addressing the specific needs of the English learners that we have in our schools. And what it means is that it needs to be multi-pronged. It has to be comprehensive. There is no silver bullet. I can't deliver a package to you and say, this is going to serve your English learners. Um, but it starts with, with that evaluation. Um, and I know I, I want to make sure I'm brief, so I just want to highlight three places where I feel like we, we as Californians together think that there's some really great work happening. And the first is Glendale Unified. They have now for over a decade, almost two decades, 
focused on implementing dual language immersion programs. They have them in several different languages. Over 34% of their students, both English learners and non-English learners are enrolled in these programs. And you can see the results in their dashboard, on their dashboard with their academic results. The other, the other area, the other group that I wanted to point out, and it's very early on, is um, LA Unified. Recently, this past year, they passed a resolution. A year ago, they passed a resolution committed to making sure that every single student graduates literate in more than one language. Started with next this year or next year's kindergarten class. Um, they're putting in some really key pieces. For example, this year they started a pilot at, along, at, at four di 14 different sites where they are focusing on providing dual language support and instruction in early childhood education. So these are preschool students, and this is really important to highlight that these students come in, we usually get them in preschool early on, and if we don't give them language appropriate access, these students are learning literacy, both in their primary language and in English. But when we don't capitalize on the assets they bring, we start seeing those very early on. So those are two academic examples. And the third example I wanted to, uh, to just highlight is because I feel like we often think about English learners with focus on their language needs is that these kids also need access to enrichment, to other pieces that make education relevant. So I want to highlight my school district as just unified. Um, and and it, just as a, as a small example, under our LCAP, we have expanded our mariachi program, right? And you might think, well, how, what does that relate to English learners? Well, we know that those uh, many of the students in this program are either English, lear are English learners, right? So we are making sure that we're funding programs that we know these kids will want to access and are interested in to make sure that they have opportunities beyond just, let's give them more intervention, let's give them more English language development. So I think I'll leave it there, um, but I think these are pieces that we need to think deeply about within districts and align them in our budgets if we want to see equity for English learners. Thank you. And, and there's a couple of things you mentioned. You mentioned the EL roadmap. If people want to find it online, where should they go? So the EL roadmap um, is actually, you can find it on the CDE web, the California Department of Education website. Um, and I can tweet that out, um, but if you just go to the California Department of Education, uh, or if you just Google English Learner Roadmap, it'll be the first link that pops up. Yeah. The other thing I'll, I'll add is I'm impressed about, um, around the work that the uh, Californians Together and others have done championing the seal of biliteracy. We probably don't have time to talk about that today, but would love to um, direct people to the Californians Together website uh, to learn more about the seal of biliteracy and how it's impacted not only uh, English learners in California, but honestly across the country. So kudos to that organization. Yeah, and our website is californiestogether.org, and uh, we actually have a whole guidance on how you can implement SILA by liter literacy. Thank you. Great, 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 great. Um, Professor Venezia, uh, uh, thank you so much for uh, uh, having uh, coming to us today and talking a little bit about the alignment between uh, K-12 and college. So we often talk about gaps that exist in K-12, um, but we don't often connect them to what's also happening in post-secondary and how we're thinking about transitions. And a lot of your research and your work has really highlighted uh, ways to close gaps through alignment. So I'd love to know what you're thinking about as you're thinking about K-12 to post-secondary alignment and closing gaps. Sure, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Sound, sounding good, thanks. Okay, great. So I realized that I stand between um, everyone interacting with us. Um, <laughs> and so I will make, I will truncate my comments a little bit to allow for more time for interaction and questions. But I very much appreciate being included in this conversation um, with this group of equity champions and scholars. Uh, for for us at Ed Insights, you know, one of the big issues that we focus on is, is our equity issues that affect students when they transition from high school to college. And I'm going to keep it bounded in that area. There are other transitions that students experience across our public education systems in terms of transfer. Um, and this, this is an exciting time to be involved in this work um, because there are a lot of changes happening at the system level and within our systems uh, running in parallel. And I'll, I'll, I'll get to those in a, a minute. But um, I, I want to set the context for this in a frame is that over the past 25 years of doing research in this area, it is just so clear that students face layers and layers of inequities prior to, go to, prior to going into college, and those are reinforced through structural inequalities in our systems often. And we've created 
created a lot of mechanisms that help us sort and make sense of large numbers of students that reinforce a lot of inequities. Uh, we know the vast majority of high school students go on to some form of post-secondary education, whether it's earning a certificate, getting additional training, or earning a degree. And historically, we have had barriers that undermine their aspirations. So we have students in California who can graduate from high school and follow all the rules, follow the A to G sequence that's required for eligibility in the UC and CSU, and end up being placed into developmental education or remedial courses. I'll use developmental ed as the phrase. Um, courses that create systemic barriers for them in terms of the time it takes, the money it takes and the hit it takes on your psyche when when you take that much time added onto your your path these are changing so again I'll get I'll get to that soon but those are the kind of barriers that really layer on additional burdens for traditionally underserved students the most I'll put a few data points out there and I know that's that's hard I only have four um, but data are so critical and superintendent Aguilar has been such so important in this area um, too, and the other panelists in terms of making clear what we're talking about. What are the big gaps that we see? So we know in California for every 10 Latino high school graduates, we know that about three are eligible for the UC or CSU. We know that about five graduated from high school without being eligible and two did not graduate. For black students, less than a third complete A to G courses and two out of 10 don't graduate from high school. In the California community colleges, we've had approximately 87% of incoming black students being required to take developmental education courses. And in the CSU, about 51% of black first year students entering in 2014 were placed into developmental math and about 44% into developmental English. So what does this mean? And I think, I find that in our work, student voices can be one of the most powerful ways to help us all understand the barriers and inequities. So I'll read a few quotes, just three. Um, that are representative uh, from our research. So one student said, there are people from our school who got straight A's and they went into college in, in our town and flunked out or got like C's and D's. So pointing to the differences in academic standards and opportunities between the systems. A student who was categorized in her community college as an English language learner said, my college counselor told me just take easy classes. Let's get you settled, take it easy, work your way up. After you get back into it, take as many hard classes as you want. This theme, we did one study with interviews, focus groups of over 250 community college students talking about the low expectations they felt over time and the impact that has on their time to finish and the cost to finish. And finally, um, a student who talked about when I got my placement test scores, I wasn't able to get into my classes because my classes were already filled up. So I had to wait a semester or go to a different class or a different college. And the insufficient capacity in our institutions is big. This is a resource issue for our institutions. The CSU is going way over enrollment in terms of the master plan's formulation of what the system should do. Um, and we, we have some resource allocation issues around being able to provide the capacity needed to serve our students. Um, we've made very big headway in recent years. So there's been a proliferation of local high school to college partnerships. Um, working to create connections and bridging student transitions and really supporting students one on one. And from a policy perspective, the CSU system is making major changes to remove barriers within the universities. It's eliminating non credit developmental education and using ways to place students in classes that honor what they've already taken and what they've learned in high school. So all students in the CSU um, have completed the A to G sequence again in high school. So they've done what we've told them to do and they should be ready some with additional supports, but they should be ready to take credit bearing classes. In the community colleges, there's new legislation that focuses, focuses on maximizing the chances that a student will enter and complete college level coursework in English and math within one year. And the placement into college level courses will be based on high school coursework, high school grades, GPA. And again, those are ways of honoring what they've learned already, in addition to providing supports and courses that blend academics and supports to help students complete. Um, so these changes really offer the help that students can take less time to graduate, less money, and, um, and the larger proportion of students will be able to graduate as these barriers are removed. And it's gonna be very important to see what happens with these big initiatives and to understand the equity implications as they're rolled out and implemented. Um, but it's an exciting time to see these top level changes happening while there's real activity in the middle of systems and 
working together between the top and the middle um, to reinforce breaking down these structural barriers, I think holds a lot of promise. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and I look forward to seeing people's questions. Okay, thank you so much, Andrea Venezia. And uh, if you have any questions, bottom right hand side of your screen, there's a little question icon. Just please send your questions. Well, we have about another 15 minutes, and so we're going to squeeze in as many questions as we can. I did want to ask uh, Professor Howard um, LCFF, um, low control funding formula, targets low income students, English learners. Uh, homeless kids, actually, and foster kids. There isn't a separate category for Latino kids and African American kids. That has, and that actually is being discussed now. Some people think that it should call out groups that, on average, do well. Obviously, we have kids who are doing brilliantly amongst all of those groups. Um, but how do do you think we need to separate out? Uh, not not obviously in physically, but in terms of the the local control funding formula targeting the fans. I, I, know, do, yeah. I do think we need to separate out because we have to be honest about the fact that certain groups are really experiencing chronic exclusion and chronic underperformance. And so in particular in this state, we know African Americans, we know Latino students, and we know certain Southeast Asian students are really uh, on the fringes and, and, and we need to be able to target specific groups. And I think there's at least five approaches that some of that LCFF funding can target. One would be an intense focus on early childhood education because we know those three groups oftentimes have access to early childhood education, but it's not high quality or early childhood education. I think we secondly need to put a focus on how we begin to reduce chronic absenteeism amongst those groups because we know that if kids are not at school, they can't learn. Oftentimes kids are absent because of a host of social and economic factors that prevent them from getting to school. Thirdly, we need to look at third grade reading scores because we know if kids are not reading by the third grade, the likelihood that they'll ever be at grade level is significantly reduced. And fourth, I think we need to make sure that those uh, three groups, again, have highly qualified, highly competent, highly trained teachers. There's been a ton of research that says that when students are consistently in classrooms with highly trained teachers, their academic outcomes are significantly enhanced. And fifth and finally, what I would say is that we have to, and I appreciate Superintendent Aguilar talking about this, we need to put an intense focus on uh, academic enrichment. We know that these students, by the time they, some of them, when they start school, they're already behind. And I think it's better for us to put those intense interventions on the front end so we're not looking at these massive gaps by the time these students get to high school. So yes, I would say we need to be very pointed, we need to be very specific, and identify those groups who are consistently at the bottom of the academic continuum. But just to clarify, are you, you think there needs to be some legislative changes or is it possible within the framework of local control funding formula to be targeting? Well, I think if, if there's if there's some degree of, 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 of malleability within the, the, the LCFF framework, then we should start there. But if there is not, I do think we need to be bold enough to say there needs to be a legislative agenda that targets specific groups. See, I think that's one of the challenges that we've had with the equality approach is that the equality approach typically uses a one size fits all blanket approach. And we just can no longer do that. I think we have to be willing to name, identify specific groups who consistently find themselves getting the short end of the stick. Can I just ask Superintendent Aguilar, that's shaking your head, yes or no? <laughs> you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I think we have to respect the spirit of the LCFF legislation um, and, um, you know, we have to confront the tension of how we have designed um, allocating budgets, uh, which is a very traditional kind of based on FTE, um, and uh, begin to access um, the rich data sets that we have. I mean, we have, we, we can identify a variation among our schools where we know that we have uh, greater needs than in others um, in any of those five areas that I mentioned. Um, and, and I think that, you know, um, in Sac City, uh, I'm very fortunate that, again, uh, I have a board of education that uh, is one that's leaning forward on this question. And, and I'm looking forward to, to the results of a, of a different budget uh, funding uh, formula that, that we will create through these indices, um, knowing quite well that, um, that some of this is going to have to be uh, addressed in the community uh, where uh, maybe the community has been used to uh, different approaches. Yeah. Hey, and just a, real, a quick follow up before we go to questions. Um, Dr. Howard, I know a lot of your work focuses on um, reducing uh, suspensions, expulsions uh, in order to uh, support um, students going on 
to graduate, going on to college, particularly for African American men who are overrepresented in uh, our our data around suspensions and expulsions. Uh, and you recently had that report get out that highlighted some of the gaps. Can you talk a little bit about um, how school climate, particularly um, excessive suspensions and expulsions, actually exacerbate um, opportunity and achievement gaps? Yeah, so I think school climate is big, Ryan, and I think part of what we have to do, we cannot divorce school climate from ideology. So I know we're talking about the importance of budget, and I think I agree with all the panelists here that budget speaks to our, our values, but I also think ideology speaks to our values. And part of what concerns me is that when we walk into certain schools and the climate is such that there's a real strong sentiment that black and brown boys are viewed or deemed as problems, we can throw all the money at that that we want to. It's not going to change some people's attitudes and mindsets. So I would love to see some, some, some steps to be taken around how we start to make sure that every teacher uh, is trained with implicit bias. Uh, every teacher is aware of microaggressions and how they affect certain groups in real, real pernicious ways. So I think we have to be mindful that school climate is all about having leadership at the top who are, who are individuals who are willing to make the tough calls uh, and, and have the difficult conversations around how we create an environment that makes it quite hostile and oftentimes incredibly difficult for young black and brown boys to learn. And I don't want to dismiss girls in this too because the data on black and brown girls is nothing to write home about either. But I'm saying that so much of the data speaks to where we see Latino boys, black boys, and even from Cambodian and Vietnamese boys as well, uh, that there's somehow this, 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 this ideology that says that they have a, a shorter window uh, or a shorter leash, if you will, uh, to, to be children, whereas other children uh, get a much longer uh, leash to be children. And therefore, that's why we see the kind of disproportionality with regards to suspensions and expulsions. Thank you. Can I just mention that uh, Ed Source, uh, we just ran an article on uh, African-American girls. Oakland has just started a program there. One of the first, perhaps the first, is focusing on African-American girls. So you can go to our website. It's mm -hmm. or to read more about that puts it in a larger context. Mm -hmm. Great. So let's open it up for questions. Um, uh, thank you for submitting your questions, by the way. Um, we have a question um, about the need to address um, students with disabilities, I believe I saw. And um, a, a focusing big on topic. those gaps, which is a big topic um, happening in the policy arena and in the practice arena, uh, given the data we see in the dashboard. Can you talk about ways um, that you're either doing that in practice or policies that you've seen to reduce uh, gaps for students with disabilities? Superintendent? Sorry, I forget the muted. Um, I, mean, I think that's exactly right. Um, and um, as everybody knows, in terms of you know following uh, policies and the California School Dashboard, I mean, a lot of districts have been identified uh, around the gaps uh, of, of, of of students with special needs. Um, you know, for for us in Sac City, this just becomes another data point that we're looking at very closely. Um, and uh, looking for uh, ways in which we're going to meet the needs of, of our students with special needs as well. Um, again, very fortunate in Sacramento that we have a very strong CAC uh, advisory committee. Uh, we uh, have launched a number of task forces um, and I've appointed uh, our CAC representatives um, in those um, um, and, and, and we appreciate their advocacy um, including, um, you know, uh, Sac City was one of the first uh, urban school districts to come out with a safe haven resolution, uh, and the CAC uh, called out that we specifically also include um, students with special needs as well. So, um, again, uh, I do think that this is a question of will. Uh, 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 school districts uh, own a lot of very uh, rich data, um, much more than what the state is able to access, and um, and and I hope that we can demonstrate um, how to how to how to work with those data to advance uh, equity, access, and social justice in Sacramento. That's right, data for the people in 2018. I appreciate that. Next question. Yeah, no, this is an interesting uh, question here. Uh, do you have any advice for better integrating the well resourced community in championing measures to enhance equity? The term equity itself seems to have become an obstacle. Multi-layered uh, question there. 
Professor Howard, do you want to? And, oh, yeah. Uh, well, I'll definitely take a stab at that. So I think herein lies our challenge. I appreciate that question because I think part of what, what we have to somehow figure out is how do we get the well-resourced communities to understand that that their fates are also tied to what happens in under-resourced communities. And I think right now we have this real major, major you know, schism where folks who are in well-resourced area, well resourced areas think that this is not their problem. This is not my concern. This is not my issue. But I think we have to recognize that the tax uh, uh, burden that everyone in the state is carrying because of homelessness, because of uh, uh, lack of access to medical resources, because of uh, uh, the lack of access to high quality schooling, what that means for social services and mental health services, we're all footing the bill for that. So we have to do a better job as equity advocates of helping to tie the fates between those who have and those who have not. I think one of the important works that, that I've recently taken a look at, Father Gregory Boyle with Homeboy Industries, he says that we need to have what he calls radical kinship. This radical kinship is how do we tie our fates to the fates of others? And I think we have not done a good enough job for whatever reason uh, to help those who are, are, are more well to do uh, to understand that this is their issue too. This is Shiloni. Do you mind if I jump in very quickly? Please. Um, so, I, you know, there's two ways to look at this, and this is within a school district, but this is also can look at between school districts. And I want to tackle the between school districts piece, because I think part of the issue um, that we face when you talk about like a district with a very low percentage of unduplicated students and a district like mine that has 88 um, uh, percent unduplicated is the fact that the base funding is not sufficient, right? So we and Sac City may have a budget of a pupil per pupil spending of about 11,000 or so, or so, right? But if you have very few of these students, you're only getting $8,600 per student, right? So when you, the average for the state puts us at around 41 across the nation, but those districts are really struggling. And so I think um, sometimes we default to this sort of us against them mentality, and that's because they're seeing this little bit of extra money that we're getting to support these extra needs, when in fact, we're not addressing the base needs of all students and it impacts our districts and it impacts um, all the districts. So I think that addressing that, that base funding and adequate funding or full funding for schools um, can help this conversation. But again, I, I think Tyrone is correct. It really has to, we really have to focus on the hearts and mind piece because this is about us. We're in a state together. And if we wanna have a successful state in the future, Right, our economy depends on all of these stu students being well educated and being prepared to take the jobs that our economy is producing. Mm -hmm. I see we we're, we're coming to uh, Aurea very quickly, and we're going to go for another five minutes because I did want to ask some, a question about teachers because uh, that's obviously central to the whole enterprise. Aurea. So I completely agree that the base uh, level of funding is inadequate in the state, and so one of the um, main areas of work for community coalition uh, at the moment is the reform, reforming prop 13 looking at the corporate uh, tax uh, loophole uh, where corporations are paying taxes on 1978 levels uh, which is really hurting our public education system and so community coalition is a part of a statewide coalition that is working to gather 550,000 signatures um, to place a ballot initiative uh, in the November uh, ballot um, to reform Prop 13. The truth is we need more funding uh, for our entire um, uh, school system. And um, that's gonna be critical in us being able to continue to move the um, uh, agenda on equity forward. Well, we're gonna see what the voters will say if this gets on the ballot. And as you said, signatures are being gathered right now. Did want to ask a question about teachers and disparities in in terms of the whole equity discussion. There have been concerns that highly qualified teachers are not are disproportionately uh, located, not not in the in the most demanding uh, settings. Although we know the teachers are doing heroic work in many of those schools, uh, but a lot of teacher turnover. Um, how does one do you see this as a key part of the equity discussion? Um, I see some some nodding heads. Uh, Superintendent, quickly, you dealing with that, and maybe and, and Andrea, if you have a thought on teacher preparation in that regard. Yeah. Yeah, I'll be very quick. Um, I think on two levels, uh, Louis, both uh, in terms of the teacher force of the future, 
um, and making sure that, um, that we diversify that teaching force. Um, we're again, very fortunate in Sacramento. We've been having uh, some uh, very productive uh, conversations with our uh, teachers union. Uh, it started with uh, a safe haven initiative where we wanted to find ways in which we can incentivize uh, DACA students uh, to not enter the labor force after a bachelor's degree and instead find ways to fund a fifth year teacher credential program uh, through one of our regional um, institutions of higher ed, Sac State being one of them. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, provide conditional employment in Sac City um, while we still have a teacher shortage um, as a way of diversifying our teacher force and then quickly uh, continued that conversation and expanded it uh, to try to uh, diversify uh, by incentivizing other uh, students that are um, both at uh, the community college and in our four-year institutions here locally. Uh, so that's one. Uh, and the second one is, I mean, again, this is uh, not from an evaluation standpoint, uh, but it, it, it is part of, of an equity index data point, um, simply um, making sure that we can see um, how do we, again, answer this question of what are we trying to make up for uh, when we're able to see that um, there is wide variation in uh, the degree of, of teachers um, that have more experience at some schools versus other schools. Uh, and the last thing that I'll say is uh, to the last question, um, I've been uh, struck um, in many ways by the level of gentrification in Sacramento. Um, in my last post, um, I didn't see it as much. Um, it impacted everything you know, where, I, where, where, where we looked for a home when we moved into this community. Um, and uh, we're very fortunate that, um, that uh, our city, uh, our mayor, Daryl Steinberg, um, understands that, uh, that the effects of, of this phenomenon is not something that uh, should just be uh, that, that, that our schools and our districts should be burdened with. So we have a very strong city district partnership to try to find ways in which we can deal with the effects of the current gentrification that Sacramento is going through. Yeah, and you know, I had someone close to me say that equity is about making communities whole. So this idea of um, looking uh, at how we can strengthen both classrooms and communities makes sense. Speaking of strengthening classrooms, a quick question. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, we often talk about in our research at Trust West is uh, looking at the data around access to rigorous coursework. So um, when we think about closing gaps, we think about implementation of the new state content standards, but we also think about um, access to A through G courses. Um, we think about access to physics and calculus, and we know uh, that gaps um, certainly exist um, with access and completion of many of those courses. How have you uh, been working on any of the A through G work, or how are you thinking about access to rigorous coursework? Is that too I'll let a fellow <laughs> panel member just so that they can respond. Do you have any anything to add? Yeah, and, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Andrea, do you have any thoughts on the A to G issues? Do you want that from a I think you want that from a, pra from a practice perspective or from more of a research angle? I mean, I think it's clearly access to appropriate coursework that lines up well with higher education expectations and having the higher education expectations link back so that it's a seamless path for students is critical where we understand what those expectations are and students don't take one set and then go on to higher education and find that wasn't sufficient. Um, but also the scaffolding to get there, um, to be able to enter successfully into the A to G and be prepared for those. And there are a lot of surrounds around the non-academic supports that are really critical. And I think the holistic approach is that we can't just divorce academics from everything else. And so being able to provide all the surrounds that my colleagues have, have mentioned integrated in to the academic environment to view people, students as a whole <laughs> um, and, and honor them and have an asset-based frame is really important. And if so I think people, that, oh, you know, young people in uh, South LA, East LA were uh, responsible for, for getting the LAUSD to adopt an A through G mm -hmm. uh, curriculum, which was, a, was asking for a more rigorous curriculum. Oh, wow. And we have seen at the LAUSD that graduation rates have increased dramatically. We have uh, mid 70s to 80% across the district. Uh, we also see an increase 
in graduation rates with uh, the A through G curriculum with a C or better. When we started this work in 99, some of our high schools were graduating 8% of their students uh, mm -hmm. with A through G curriculum with a C or better. And now some of our schools are at about 30%. That's still not as high as we want, but the graduation rates have definitely climbed significantly. And the A through G um, completion with a C or better is also increasing at a really good rate. And so we know that when you target uh, dollars um, and when you uh, look at students holistically meeting their social emotional needs, so that they can be ready to learn in an A through G curriculum, students will do better. We've already okay. debunked the idea that they don't. And then last thing with the Prop um, 13 reform, you know, if we do pass Prop 13, it would be an additional $9 billion uh, for the state, uh, for public education and communities. And so I just wanna say there's a lot at stake with us bringing new uh, revenue, which we know is a part of uh, real education reform. Uh, one, one, one minute. Very yeah. brief. And actually, I'm going to speak about Jorge's district in Sac City and San Diego. One of the things that I've noticed when they talk about how they've been able to dramatically increase their A through G completion rates is the focus that they've had at the district administrative level, cracking open what's happening at the school sites, even digging down into student level data to make sure that in those, those implicit biases or these practices that we've had in place are being um, targeted and they and and we're changing those right and so those two districts I look at those increases and you, you hear them talk that's how they've made it happen right they're not just saying they're not just get, sending out mandates saying do this work they are putting in the oversight and they're making sure and they are actually physically looking at this data information themselves to make sure that everyone is aware of what's happening so I wanted to add that well, thank you so much. And I knew that we would not get to all the issues, but this has been a very rich discussion. Andrea Venizia, there was a request for some of the statistics that you put out. People didn't get all of them. I don't know if you could, we could send them to the participants, or I know a lot of it is on your website. Yep. And I'll also say that a number you can of. Contact me through the website. Through what? Yeah. What's your. What's your. People can uh, contact me through the website. Which is, which is what? Oh, sorry, it's spelled out a little bit, but Ed Insights, our Ed Insights website, and we can tweet it out okay. too. We can tweet the data out. I'll also say that Dr. Venezia, Dr. Howard, and Adrian Montes Rodriguez are uh, part of our senior fellowship. We've been working with Ed Trust West over the year, um, and uh, we'll continue to engage folks who are listening. Um, by providing more opportunities for you to talk to those three and everyone on the panel. So um, with that, thank you, panel. Uh, super appreciate uh, the discussion. Um, it was very compelling. And obviously, we need more time to talk about this. And uh, thank you, Lewis, my co-moderator and EdSource. Appreciate that. Well, thank you, Ryan. And as we said, we hope this is just the beginning of the discussion. We'll be doing more of these. And uh, thank you to all of you who, who tuned in for all your work in the trenches uh, to ensure that all California's children succeed. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks.